page, page number 23. Let's all stand as we sing. Why, something's going to be wrong this morning, that's for sure. <laughs> stand, let's sing. Page number 23. <laughs> Everything that 
uh, as we experience the Lord's life there with us, our joy and sorrows. Lord, I just pray this morning you'd help us to lean on you this morning as a uh, uh, as an opportunity, Lord, just to get closer to you, uh, to love you more, Lord, that you love us, and uh, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray uh, that you do with those who are able to be here this morning. Pray for Brother Lee, Lord, in the hospital, Bill Sexton, uh, also in the hospital, and uh, Lord, others, Lord, that are traveling, just ask, uh, Father, your mercies and your grace upon all of those. Father, again, we ask your blessing. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the Sunday morning services of our Lord Baptist Church. It's a great day to be in church. Amen. Um, I was looking through the songs this morning, and I read a small song that I just read. And it's this great play song. The imagery is really good. And it gives some really good advice over here. It says, The Lord reign, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad for Cloudless and darkness around the valley, righteousness and judgment of all tension is thrown. A fire goes before him, and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightning and lightning the world, the earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the the heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. Confound it, be all they that serve great images, that boast themselves of idols, worship him on all the gods. Zion heard and was glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoiced. <coughs> For thou, Lord, art art high above all the earth, thou art exalted above all gods. Ye above the Lord, Haiti. He preserves the souls of the saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. The wise are sons of the righteous. Isn't that cool? He sows life. He sows the ability to see and know you're going like seeds for everybody. I love the imagery here. Life is sown for the righteous. The gladness for the upright in heart. And then here comes the advice and the exhortation for everybody. Rejoice in the Lord, the righteous, and give thanks and the remembrance of the souls. And that's what we're here to do. Thank you all for being here. Let's take a look at our announcement. As always, Sunday school starts at 10 a.m. And if you're missing Sunday school, you're really missing it. I know we do our gym today. Please see Sunday school. Worship services at 11 a.m. Our evening services are at 5 p.m. on Sunday. And then Wednesday evenings, our services are at 7 p.m. We always provide the nursery for our Sunday Wednesday evenings are something very special at our program. We do dig deep into the Word of God and the Lord of the Lord's services. And we always provide activities for the children as well. Looking forward, October 29th, we're going to have a church fellowship after the evening service. So bring your favorite food, bring a little, you bring a little bit to share, and we're all going to have a good time fellowship with each other. November 23rd is Thanksgiving Day, and then December 25th is Christmas Day. And we almost got 2017 to be here. I'm looking forward to 2018 and Friday. If you're a visitor with us today, you wouldn't mind reaching out to us and sharing in front of you. You can see one of these little green visitor boxes on a visitor's card. And what I'm asking you to do, if you don't mind, is fill it out, and we would love to have a regular visit with us here today. And we're pretty friendly people, and you know, don't be surprised if folks come in and say hello to you and shake your hand. Again, thank you for being here today, and as always, I know everyone's been here.
in many situations and many uh, circumstances throughout the Bible from uh, the time of Noah and, uh, maybe before that time uh, through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and through David and uh, through other uh, realms and kingdoms that uh, have been uh, found in the Word of God. We find that many of these men uh, or that we read about have built an altar and for several various reasons Lord, they built that altar Lord, I just pray this morning that you would help us to understand the importance, even in our day and time, of building an altar unto the Lord. Lord, I pray that you bless this message to our hearts and to our lives. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning especially that you would uh, Lord, that work in each and every heart. Uh, Lord, that we go back to the uh, Welsh revivals when uh, the, they prayed that uh, uh, at the beginning of each meeting that uh, the folks would obey the truth. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would obey the truth this morning. And then, Father, as the, as the preacher, as the one standing behind this sacred desk, I ask this morning that you would again fill me with the Holy Spirit and with power, Lord, that you would help me, Lord, to preach the word with boldness. We ask all this in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we look at the word of God, and as I mentioned in our prayer this morning, uh, there are a number of, of uh, mentions in the Word of God of building an altar, of building an altar. In the uh, early years of my, uh, after I got saved, I got saved in 1972, and in the early years of my salvation, uh, the preachers used to preach and, and stand in the pulpit and encourage the, uh, the families to have what was called a family altar. You say, well, what is a family and altar? A family and altar is when husband and wife and children, um, they would get together at a appointed time uh, in the home, usually in the evening time. Uh, some would get around the table. Some would get uh, in the living room around the couch, and they would read the Word of God, and uh, the dad would expound upon some truth of the Word of God, and then the family would pray together. That was known as the family altar. Would to God. Uh, that our homes today would go back uh, to a time of worship in our home, that we would learn uh, to worship God, that we would teach our children to worship the Lord. We have lost the focus of what it is to worship God. We go to churches nowadays, and uh, we have a group that stands on the on the platform. They look like a, a performance of uh, a, a, a Las Vegas nightclub. Uh, they wiggle and they dance and they sing and they make all kinds of uh, things and, and say we're doing this unto the Lord. And you say, well, you shouldn't be talking about that. Well, I believe and in uh, my estimation and believing I'm old school uh, and what I believe, but I do believe that the house of God is a house of worship. I do believe that the music that we use in the house of God should not only glorify God, but to help us to worship God. The hymns of old that we use in our hymn book and soul stirring hymns uh, from the sword of the Lord, every hymn in there has something to do with the word of God. It has something to do with exalting the name of Christ. Uh, this morning we say there's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. There's power, power in the blood. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, the scripture teaches us, there is no remission of sin. We need that blood. We need that power that comes from the blood of Jesus Christ in order for ourselves to be saved. It's an important. Uh, we sang the song <clears throat> this morning that uh, we mentioned in the prayer. Uh, uh, I, I can't remember what it is, but uh, you remember what it was. You sang it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But as we uh, thought, thought about that song, we thought about the worship and, 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 and the, the, the closeness of God. Uh, that brings us into a better understanding of who God is. And so every aspect, <clears throat> excuse me, of the, uh, I don't know what happened to my throat this morning, but it's not going to make it, I don't think. Pour some cool water on it, maybe it'll help. Anyway, as we come in this morning, as we think about the songs that we've sung, we, we worship in an attitude of surrendering our hearts in our minds, we come in <clears throat> into the house of God and we worship uh, through the preaching of the Word of God. Through the preaching of the Word of God. You say, well, that's worship. Well, uh, normally we have our, our, 
our folks that stand when we read the Word of God, and you say, well, you know, that's something, why do y'all do that? Well, in the, in, in the you know, Old Testament, uh, in the days of Ezra, uh, when they came back from captivity and they came uh, back into the land uh, and they dedicated the temple, what happened? Uh, they found the Word of God and as they, they stood there for from early in the morning to late in the evening, literally stood to hear the reading of the Word of God. Would to God today that the Word of God was as important to us as it was in the days of Ezra. As it was in the days of Josiah when they told Josiah the young king, we found the word of God in the house of God. Where else should the word of God be? But in the house of God. He said, we found the word of God, we found it in the house of God, and they began to read the word of God. And what happened? They rent their clothes, they cried out to God because they realized how far they had been. But in our churches today, we're more like Jehudi. Uh, they brought the word of God uh, into, uh, into the king and the, they read the word of God and they took a pen knife and cut it in pieces and threw it in the fire and burned it. Uh, as Jeremiah was preaching and had, had written the word of God, they just put it in the fire. We don't want to know about that. We don't want to talk about that. We don't want to listen to that. Would to God again that we would get back uh, to hearing the preaching of the word of God. It's important. That's a part of our worship. The offering this morning. So I knew you was going to get there, preacher. You're a Baptist preacher. You're always going to preach about the offering. No, the offering is a time of worship. It is a time of opening our hearts and opening uh, our 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 uh, our gifts to God. You said, "Well, I didn't have anything to give." Be thankful that you're alive. Be thankful you crawled out of bed this morning. Be thankful uh, that you uh, had hot water. Be thankful that you were not in Mississippi this morning when uh, when Nate hit, hit land. Uh, be thankful this morning that you didn't put your foot uh, in, in six foot of water. Be thankful this morning uh, that you had a place to come. Be thankful that you had a car to drive. Be thankful. By the way, do you realize that you live better than the kings of old? You think of, of Solomon and all of his glory and the, and, and the great uh, house that he lived in. I mean, he didn't have electricity. He didn't have air conditioning. You say, well, oh, no, you live better than the kings of old live. We ought to be thankful for what it is that we've done. And what, what it is that God has done for us. As children of God, we need to build, us, build ourselves an altar of worship. You say, well, what is an altar? I'm glad that you asked. Uh, because there's an intelligent answer uh, to that question. <clears throat> Many times in the Bible, when we find the word altar mentioned, there's uh, six uh, uh, aspects. You might want to write these down. These might help you. These might benefit you. And you might even find more in the reading and the preaching uh, uh, or, uh, of the Word of God. But there's six of these that I would share with you this morning. First of all, a, an altar builder, uh, a, a, an altar is a place of worship. Just mentioned that just a moment ago. It is a place of worship. What is worship? Worship is surrendering yourself to God. And you say, I don't understand that. Surrendering yourself to God. You see, uh, I, 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 through the years I've watched uh, uh, different people and different uh, uh, country stars because I grew up with parents who uh, believed that country and western music was the only music that ever uh, graced the, uh, the world. And uh, so we were... They're, you know, but what I would see is they would be like on Hee Haw. They'd, they'd sing all those worldly songs and they would have all that worldly entertainment. But at the very end, they say, now let's sing a hymn. And they'd, they'd get all pious and they'd, they'd get all quiet and they'd fold their hands. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Or how great thou art or, or something. They would say, I mean, it was just like a, a moment out of, out of, uh, everything just to sing a song and you wonder uh, how much that song really meant to those who sang that song. Well, I used to tell me I need to get a new, new country song, but I can't remember any of them. And the only one I can remember, there's a tear in my beard because I'm crying for you, dear. 
I said, now that helps me worship. I hope not, doesn't it? I'm drinking doubles and she's living single. I mean, really? That's going to help me to worship? I mean, and, and this is the kind of music we're going to listen to? And so, I mean, honestly, when we come to God, we worship Him. And what worship means is to humble ourselves, submit ourselves to God. We've got to come off of our high horse. You remember in Luke chapter number 18, Luke chapter number 18, Jesus tells the story or the parable of these two men that come into the temple of the house of God to pray. He said one came in, he was a Pharisee, and he stood up in the crowd, and, and he's, he's, he's speaking, and he said, Oh, dear God, oh, Holy Father, I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And he goes through this, this thing of, of lifting himself up and exalting himself. And then, and then Jesus says, now on the other side of the room, there was a, a man, he was a publican. Now publicans were not well respected. They were the tax collectors. How many of you respect the IRS? Come on. You don't respect the IRS and they didn't respect the publicans. Not only they, they, the publicans, not only were they tax collectors, what else were they? They were thieves. The king said, I want this much in taxes. I said, well, we'll collect this much and I'll put this in my pocket and I'll give this to the king. So they were not well liked, but this public is standing up here in a corner and he's quoting his chest. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, which one of the two do you think is going to go to his house justified? <laughs> the one that humbled himself. The one that cried out to God. The one that said, be merciful to me, a sinner. Not the one that said, bless me for, because I'm worthy of blessing. You see, when we come to the house of God, what we need to understand is we come to a place of worship, a place of humbling ourselves to God. Secondly, it was a place of sacrifice. A place of sacrifice. Uh, if you read in um, uh, Genesis chapter number 12, uh, Abraham uh, saw God, God talked to him and gave him the promise uh, of a son and, and the promise of giving him this land uh, that would uh, that would be blessed and they, and they would bless him and, uh, and all. And, and he gives him, and then he says he built an altar. What did he, he offered a sacrifice on that altar. You say, what is a sacrifice? What is a sacrifice? You say, well, in the olden days, a sacrifice, or in the Bible days, a sacrifice was taking a lamb and putting it up on the altar and, and shedding the blood of that lamb and, and, and sending that sweet-smelling savor to God as an offering for sin. It was an offering for sin. I mean, there were several different offerings. There was the the offering of the first fruits. There was a sin offering. There was... I mean, all of these offerings. Now, what is it the purpose of the offering? The offering was to, uh, as a sacrifice uh, to God. It was a, it's something that's going to cost you something. In fact, David, uh, when he was bringing the ark of God back into Israel, back into Jerusalem, uh, it was had been in captivity. The Philistines had had it. They sent it back. It was in the house of Arana, and, and David goes to get the house to get the ark of God. And Aaron says, he says, let me buy this threshing floor from you because I want to worship, I want to sacrifice to God. And Aaron says, oh, no, 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 no. I'm just going to give to you. You're the king. I'm just going to give to you. No, 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 no. I want to pay for it. He said, why do you want to pay for it? He said, because I don't want to offer to God something that doesn't cost me something. You see... Our idea is that, you, God, you give, 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 give. These prosperity preachers out there in our society today, they're saying, well, all you need to do is you just need to stand up. You need to look God in the eye and tell God, I want. That's not what my Bible says. That is not what my Bible says. My, my, when, when you get things from God, I guarantee you it's because you humbled yourself, you've surrendered yourself, you've submitted yourself to God, and God in an answer to prayer would supply what you have need of. But you see, the sacrifice that we have is a sacrifice of the heart. Now, 
Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Go, wait a minute. When you sacrifice something, it dies. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And what God is asking you to do, what Paul is telling you to do, is to die to yourself. We use Romans chapter number 10, verses 9 and 10. We say that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, and believe in the righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, the, the premise here is that He is Lord. He is Lord. He, he controls your life. That's what Paul is saying in chapter 12, verse 1, that we submit ourselves as a living sacrifice. We're saying, God, I'm giving you everything that I am. The story is told years ago of a preacher. They were taking, receiving the offering. And before the offering, the preacher stood and, and said, Now, folks, we just need to surrender ourselves and, and, and give ourselves to God. And, uh, and as we give, we'd be thankful that God, have, we have something to give. And as they passed the offering plate, one little girl took the offering plate. She sat it on the floor. And everybody watched her and wondered, wondered what in the world she's doing. And as she, as she put the, floor, the offering plate on the floor, she stood in the offering plate and said, God, I don't have anything to give but myself. That's what a sacrifice is. It's saying, God, I'm going to give you who I am. I'm going to give you what, what I am. I'm going to surrender myself for your use. I'm going to surrender myself for you to use me however you want me to be. Be here tonight. We're going to talk about that in tonight's message about surrendering and, and saying, God, I'll do. Uh, number three, uh, a, an altar is a place of refuge. An altar is a, a place of refuge. Many uh, would run to the altar uh, when they needed the protection of God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble, the psalmist says. You see, when we come to the altar, we, we place our, 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 our lives in the very hands of God himself. He is our protector. Jesus put it this way in John, in John chapter number four, uh, 14 and John chapter 15 and John chapter 16. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send another comfort and he will be in you and he will lead you and he will guide you into all truth. You see, when you have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in you, you have that comforter. You have that protector. You have that one that, that is uh, a part of your everyday life. Not only that, but uh, is he, uh, our worship and our sacrifice, and our record, but is a place of prayer. The altar is a place of prayer. We have forgotten and we, we do not know what prayer is anymore. We think prayer is asking. Dr. John L. Rice wrote a book a number of years ago called Prayer, Asking and Receiving. And you would think, well, the pre premise of that is I'm just going to keep asking for, of God anything and everything I want, and God is obligated to give me. That's not the premise of the book. That is not the purpose of the book. When we pray, we're asking God. We're, we're, we're surrendering ourselves to God, number one. We're confessing our sin to God, number two. We are, uh, we are uh, uh, praying for the needs of, of others. We are uh, All of these things is part of prayer. I dare say some of you might have children that are astray that you that need your prayers. I do believe that I'm a product of, of, uh, of an uncle and a grandmother that prayed for me. Because I didn't go to church. My family didn't go to church. My grandmother did. My uncle did. And every opportunity my uncle had, he shared the gospel with us. And finally, I, I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not directly because of my uncle, but indirectly because my uncle prayed for me. I do believe that uh, it is our responsibility as parents, as grandparents, as friends, as neighbors, uh, to pray for those who are unsaved. 
I do believe it is our responsibility uh, to do all that we can to bring uh, our brothers and sisters, uh, our neighbors, our friends, everyone that we come in contact with to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Jude talks about this and says that we are to uh, that we are to have compassion, pulling them out of the fire. What fire are we pulling them out of? We're pulling them out of the fires of hell. Very important to understand that our prayer life is more than, dear God, thank you for giving me a good night's sleep. I'll see you then this evening. Amen. Lord, that car almost hit me. Thank you. Oh, my boss is in a stint this morning. Lord, you better help me. <laughs> if you don't help me, somebody's going to die. I mean, and, and that's the kind of prayers we pray. I remember one of my college professors saying when he, when he, when he went to college as a college freshman, he, he, he went to a Bible college, and as he's going into the Bible college, he thought, you know, he said that uh, as a, as a quote-unquote Christian, as going into a Bible college, I guess I need to learn how to pray. And he had heard all the stories about going into the closet, and, you know, and he, so he, he, he worked, and he labored, and he made out this prayer list. He, he said, I had a good long prayer list of all these people. I prayed for my mom and my daddy and my sisters and my brothers and my cats and my dogs. And he said, I had this long list of, of people that I was going to pray for and all these needs that needed to be met and all of this that needs to be done in the church and, and, and souls and all this. He said, I got in that closet. He said, I closed the door and it was dark in there. He said, I couldn't see my list. He said, I got down on my knees and I, uh, in my makeshift altar, my, my makeshift uh, 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 prayer room, and, and, and I began to pray, and, and I just cried out to God. And he said, I, I prayed, and he said, it seemed like it was an hour. He said, he, he thought, man, I've been praying for an hour. I better uh, uh, check to see what time it is. I might be missing something, you know. So he looked, he, he got outside where he could see us watching his five minutes. Can I get a witness? You think you're going to pray for a long time and you have all these things to pray for? You, you realize we don't pray near enough. You see, the altar is a place of prayer. We need to pray about everything. In fact, the Bible teaches us in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 22. No, 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Pray without ceasing. Evening and morning and noon will I pray and cry aloud, David said in the Psalms. You see, our responsibility is to cry out to God 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You say, well, preacher, i got to sleep sometime. i got to eat sometime. i got to have some rest sometime. How can, how can a body pray 24 hours a day, 7 days a week? Well, I don't know. I've been saved for 45 years. And I haven't figured it out yet, but if you figure it out, if you let me know, I appreciate it. But that's what the Bible teaches. Is it not? Pray without ceasing. I mean, when do you stop? We need to become people of prayer. Number five. It's a place that vows. A place that vows. B O W S, vows. Promises. I remember distinctly years ago, my, my family comes from the northwest corner of Mississippi, and, and, and it's right to that area is known as, uh, as Tornado Alley. And one, I mean, one day you can have, have a beautiful, sunshiny, clear day, not a cloud in the sky the next minute. I mean, it can be black and ominous and green and uh, and all kinds, and, and the storm and the wind start picking up. Well, we were out, my aunt and uncles, one day, and uh, as a kid, we, I mean, I was 16, 17 years old, or probably 16, 15, 16, and uh, we're out in the yard, my uncles are, 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 are barbecuing, and we're having a big uh, get-together, and all of a sudden, the sky turns black, and then it turns green, and then it starts hailing. 
Well, we ran into a, a, a stone building, a, a block building, and we got into the corner of that block building, and all of a sudden, my aunts who uh, were not accustomed to praying, was, were not accustomed to going to church, and were not accustomed to anything, all of a sudden started singing amazing grace. Then they began to pray. Oh, God, please help us through the storm. Help us, Lord, that we not have any damage. And, and, and on and on they went. They began to cry out to God. And my, my uncles were out, out in the outside with everything going, with the, the meat and everything. And, you know, they got their beers open, and they're just having a, a good time. You know, my aunts, they're in there. They're just crying out to God. I guess let the women do the praying. I'm in. That's it out loud. I'm into it. They let the women go in and pray. They stayed out. They said, well, the, the women take care of that. That's what the philosophy is in our society today. The women can take care of that. No. Men need to step up to the plate and lead the family the way God intended. Hello? Somebody asked me if this is going to be a nice one this morning. I, 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 I never can tell. They began to make vows to God. Oh, dear God, if we get out of this, Lord, we'll go to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night from this day forward. Well, a tornado passed over and hit a few, uh, you know, a few towns over, and, and all we were spared and nothing in. And my aunts, oh, they're, they're so excited because, you know, God heard their prayer and all that. And guess how many of them went to church on Sunday morning? <coughs> Not a one. You see, we make vows. But we don't mean them. We say, God, we're going to do this if you do this. But we don't really mean it. Because if God does this, we're going to do what we want to do anyway. Be here for the message tonight. Don't help you. You're going to stay home. <laughs> yeah. I ain't going to that one, no. Hey, buddy. <laughs> you see, when we make vows to God, they're binding. That your yay be yay and your nay be nay. When you make a vow, no man putting his hand in the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Those are Jesus' words, not mine. I learned a principle about that, what Jesus was talking about, because my, my granddaddies, both of them were farmers, and, uh, and, and uh, they let me drive a tractor. <laughs> I'm sure they went back and redid everything I did, but uh, they'd be, I'd be on the tractor and I'd be sitting in Papa's lap and, and I'd be driving that tractor. And Papa said, "Now you look right down there. You see that down there? You just go straight down there. You just you just drive that tractor right straight down to there." And I'd go back like this, and those roads are going just like this. You know what Jesus was talking about? When you're looking back here instead of looking at him, you don't stay on the right track. You don't stay on the right path. You go whatever direction you want to go. You see, when you're focused on Jesus, you go straight. You see, the problem in our lives, we, we number one, we don't have an altar, but number two, we, when we make vows to God, we really don't need them. God, if you let me out of this, <laughs> believe me, I'll quit drinking. Lord, Lord, if you help me pass this drug overdose this time, I'll never do another drug again. Dear God, if you help me out of this awful marriage I'm in, I got stuck in uh, because of my own fault, because I wouldn't listen to you, because I wouldn't listen to the family, and I wouldn't listen to the preacher, and I wouldn't listen to nobody, uh, and I'm in this terrible mess. You get me out of this mess, Lord, I'll serve you the rest of my days. Uh -huh. That's how we are. But God intends for us to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him. A, that's our reasonable service. That's our reasonable service. Why is that? Because we're serving God. Come, come on uh, to the next one, number, uh, number six. It's a place of thanksgiving. It's a place of thanksgiving. It's a place of giving thanks. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have sinned against us. You say, Thanksgiving. What do we have to be thankful for? I, I gave a whole myriad of lists, a whole laundry list of things to be thankful for uh, at the beginning of the message. I mean, hot water. I lived with my grandparents for, for about six months in the wintertime. My grandparents got electric, got uh, uh, indoor plumbing in 1972. You haven't lived until you've gone outside to the outhouse at 32 degrees. They didn't keep the heat on inside the house. There was no central air and heat. In fact, there was no air at all, but there was no heat. The heat was turned off. They had a heater in the living room, and they had a heater in the kitchen, and that was it. And it was a shotgun house. So from the living room all the way straight through to the kitchen, there was no heat. You got into the, uh, into the kitchen, there was heat. You had to get from one to the other before you froze to death. And modesty was not an issue. You got there as fast as you could. Now, folks, thankful for things that God has given to us. We're not near thankful enough. We have a, we have a day coming up in, thanks, in, in, in November for Thanksgiving Day, and I guarantee you that, that a very, very few, very minute few, will honestly be thankful for what God has done for them throughout the year. Most will be thankful for Football. I hope not this year. I hope you're boycotting. You see, being thankful for what it is that God has done for us. What has God done for you? I've made it through two years of being a, a widower. You say, how has that happened? Uh, how, how's that work? Not very well. But God sustained me through it. God's taking care of me. God's taking care of my family. I'm thankful that God has provided uh, for every need that I have. Not every want I have, but every need that I have. You can look at this, this, this uh, uh, wonderful physique of a body and tell that I have not missed very many meals. I don't know what happened to the hair. It just, you know, it turned gray and now it's, per it's turning loose. But, I mean, God has been so faithful through all these years. I can be thankful for what he's done. I want us to look at Genesis chapter 26 again. And I want us to go to verse number 24. Verse number 24. In verse number 24, God is speaking to Isaac. And as God begins to speak to Isaac, this is not God's first occasion to speak to Isaac, but notice what God says in verse number 24 of Genesis chapter 26. He says, And the Lord appeared unto him the same night. What night was that? It was the night that Isaac was out in the middle of the wilderness. You say, well, why was Isaac out in the middle of the wilderness? Well, if you would read the Word of God, you would know and I wouldn't have to tell you. But since you don't, or maybe since you have read it for a while, I'll tell you. Okay, Isaac uh, and his brother Esau, or Jacob and Esau, put it that way. They were, where am I, what story am I at? Where am I at? Huh? Who knows? Yeah, it's Isaac here. We're, Isaac uh, has uh, it is is on his way. He's traveling. He's going where it's a a a, a um, time of famine, and God has sent him down into Egypt, and Abimelech has has uh, kicked him out of uh, uh, of Gerar, and he's gone down to uh, be out here in Beersheba, and he's all alone. He's out in the wilderness. He takes a stone and makes a pillow. He 
lays his head down. Notice that God appears to him. He says this, he said, I, I, God says, I, he appeared to him and says, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Isaac knew who Abraham his father was, and Isaac knew exactly what God had done for him, the father. Because he was a product of God's blessing. Abraham and Sarah did not have any children. And because they did not have any children, God said, I'm going to give you a child in your old age. And I'm going to restore the time of life for Sarah. And when you, the time of life is restored, you'll have a child and it'll be a child of promise. And Isaac was that child of promise. And Isaac, God tells Isaac, he said, look, he said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. If you remember from Genesis chapter number 22, here's Abraham, and he has an 18-year-old son by the name of Isaac. And God tells Abraham, he said, I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, and I want you to take him to a place that I'm going to show you. And I want you to offer him as a sacrifice. What happens? The Bible teaches us in Genesis chapter 22 that Abraham immediately got up the next morning. He saddled his donkey, he got everything together, and he and his son and the servants, they, they headed out uh, to the place that God would show them. And uh, they were about three days' journey uh, away from where they were going. And Abraham said, y'all stay here, me and the son, me and the boy. We're fixed to go uh, uh, yonder. We're going to sacrifice. We'll be back. On the way, Isaac says, Dad, he said, now look, I, he said, you know, I know you're getting a little old, a little forgetful. Have you got to the place where you walk in the room and forgot where you, why you're there? So you walk out to go back and find, forget where you came from anyway? He said, Dad, I know you're getting a little old and, and, and forgetful. He said, we have the fire and we have the wood, but we don't have a sacrifice. And Abraham looked at Isaac and said, Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. A prophetic statement because Jesus Christ, God's Son, was offered as a sacrifice for us on the cross of Calvary. But this was a picture. God took, Abraham took Isaac and he built the altar there and he, he, he bound Isaac and put him on that altar. Uh, or on that altar and he raised his hand back with that knife and about to pierce his son through and God stayed his hand. So when God tells Isaac, he said, I, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. I think Isaac knew exactly who he was talking about. Knew exactly who he was talking about. But notice what he says uh, following that. He says, fear not. Fear not. I am with you. You see, when we get into places where we don't know the outcome, the human thing to do is to fear. And when we fear, we make decisions that we should not make. We make the wrong decisions. I heard a wise preacher say years ago, you never make a decision when your decision maker is broke. You say, what does he mean by that? When you're in the midst of a trial, when you're having problems, you're having difficulties, you're having a difficult marriage, and all of these things, do not make any decisions until you get to the place of security, until you get to the place of knowing that you are in the presence of all Mighty God. And that's where Abraham, Isaac was right there. He was in the presence of Almighty God. I am the God of thy father, Abraham. Fear not, I am with thee. You see, you need to understand that God is with us at all the time. There's never a time that God is not with us. Notice uh, uh, again, he said, for I am with thee and will bless thee. He said, I will bless thee. What did God tell Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1? He said, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. He said, I will bless thee. I will give you, I will give you seed as a sand by the seashore. Abraham, or Isaac, if you read the previous verses that we read, he had, he had plenty of cattle, he had plenty of everything, servants, and everything in the world. I guess we should put teaching on Isaac because he had servants. 
trunk. Mine. I just put my whole message under the water. You see, God said, I will bless thee. Not only will I bless thee, but notice who he says, I will multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. Because Abraham, your father, was a very faithful man. And Abraham was known as the friend of God. And because Abraham was faithful in all of his house, because of Abraham, your father, I'm going to bless you beyond measure. And if you notice the response of, of Isaac in verse number 25, he says, And he builded an altar there. And he called upon the name of the Lord. He built an altar there, and he called on the name of the Lord. But not only did he build an altar there, and not only did he call on the name of the Lord, he pitched his tent right there. In other words, he said, this is the place that I'm going to reside until God says something different. He pitched his tent there. If you fast forward a little bit, and you go to chapter 28, notice, if you will, verse 20. This is Jacob, and I kind of got two stories combined here in my, in my story, but notice, if you will, Jacob's vow. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have, have set for a pillar shall be God's uh, house. And of all that uh, thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tent unto thee. Jacob was the one that was sleeping out of the wilderness on the stone. He was fleeing his brother's uh, wrath because he had deceived his brother and stolen his birthright. And his father said, now you need to go to Padanaram. You need to go to your, your mother's family. Uh, and you need to uh, stay over there for a while until Esau gets to where uh, he's calmed down a little bit. God speaks to Abraham, to Jacob and says, I'm with you. And here we see Jacob makes a vow. He builds that altar. He makes a vow. And, and, and there's not uncertainty. If you, if you notice what he says, he says now, verse number, um, verse number 20 again, he said, if God will be with me. God had already said God was with me. The, the if there means since God will be with me. I will do what? Since God is with me, he says, and will keep me in, the, in this way that I go and will give the, me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. He's not saying God's not going to do this because God's already promised he's going to do it. What he's saying, I, because God's going to do this, now I am going to serve God. What you need to understand in your Christian life is if you're a child of God, God did a major work in your life in saving you. He fitted you for the kingdom of heaven. He forgave all of your sin, past, present, future. He put your sin as far as the east is from the west. He put your sins to the very depths of the ocean to be remembered no more. And he says, now because of all of that, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to continue in your lifestyle? Are you going to continue living the way that you're the way you're living, and you're just going to play church and you're just going to uh, masquerade uh, a, a Christian facade uh, uh, to people in the in the world? Your Facebook page is filled with filthiness and, and, and vulgarity and all of that. And then you want to post something that says, well, God is so good. Folks, people read everything before that too. And everything after that. 
I know somebody's on my Facebook page are not going to be much longer. And they will, they will praise God. Oh, God is so good. He's taking care of my family. Blah, 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 blah. And the next post will have the F word in it. And, everything. and I'm going, out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. No. Scripture says this ought not to be. You see, your life is different. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on, uh, not on things of the world, but on the things above. Amen. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. You see, your life ought to be different. That's the problem with modern day churches. Uh, you come in as you are, you leave as you came, and there's no change that takes place. When God comes in, change takes place because it's known as repentance. And repentance means a change of heart, a change of direction, a change from, from the old life to the new. When I got saved, I, I was a wicked, rotten sinner deserving of hell. And I realized I was going to hell because of my sin. And I realized that I was going to bust hell wide open. And, and someone showed me in the scripture that Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. And he paid my sin debt. And he wanted to save me. And I turned from that wicked lifestyle. And I turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. And all that's behind me. And now I'm marching. And I'm going towards heaven. And with Jesus Christ... My focus is on Him, not on this world. The problem is that Jesus said some of them have turned around and they've gone back uh, as a dog goes back to his vomit. And that's gross. Folks, something needs to change. If you are a child of God, you need a place, you need an altar in your life. You need to have a place where you get alone with God on a daily basis and you read the Word of God and you pray and you get, uh, you get information from God through His Word. Amen. Quit listening to all of these people out there that know nothing of God who are going to tell you how to live the Christian life because they don't know. Stay in a good church. Read the Word of God. Study and, and see what God has. Because God, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God as you ought to be, because you're a child of God, and the Holy Spirit of God comes in the moment that you receive Jesus Christ, then you have the same Holy Spirit that I have. And you have the same opportunity to know the Word of God the same as I do. I may have been to Bible college. I may have a master's degree. And one of these days, Lord willing, if I ever finish that, that dissertation, I'm going to have a doctorate. That probably will never happen in this lifetime, but I'm right like, within a tongue's breath of it. But that doesn't make me know the Bible any better than anybody else. Because the Holy Spirit of God, He knows it all. <laughs> And he can make it clear and plain. I know people say, ah, I just don't read the Bible because I can't understand. If you're saved, you'll understand the Word of God. You just mark it down. I ain't that good at reading. I'm not that good at grammar either. That ain't stop a lot of people. Folks, we need to have an altar. We need to have a place that we worship God. Where we pray. Where we read the Word of God. But we're alone with God on a daily basis. Because that's where our strength comes. That's where our power comes. That's where our worship and, and work for God is going to come from. Maybe you're here this morning say, Preacher, if I die right now, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I don't even know Jesus Christ. Well, then you need to find him in bed. And that's what this offer is for. May we stand for prayer. Father, we thank you today for your blessings. We thank you for the word of God. Lord, I pray that you help us, Lord, to build ourselves an altar, uh, Lord, to you. Lord, that we find a place that we could be alone. Jonathan Edwards found a place in the woods. It is said that the that the Indians would surround him and watch him as he prayed and, uh, and threatened to kill him. Uh, and and, and as he prayed, it was so intense in his prayer that the snow around him melted. 
Indians saw one day a, a poisonous snake crawl across his legs and, and, and leave him unharmed, and, and they began to respect a man such as Jonathan Edwards. Lord, many have, have, have told stories of, as, as, as those who have, have uh, as George Muir, have, have filled a, 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 an orphanage or with food uh, for children without even uh, letting anybody know uh, what was necessary to achieve. Lord, we can be people of prayer. Lord, we can be people that have a, a, a personal, intimate relationship with you. Lord, I pray that those that are here today would seek that this morning. And then, Father, I pray for those that are here. If there's somebody here this morning that does not know 100% sure for a Bible reason they have a home in heaven. Lord, I pray that they'd step out of an aisle. They'd come and take me by the hand and say, Preacher, I want Jesus. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to that hell that you spoke of just a few moments ago. I want Jesus. Lord, we'll take the Bible and show them how to be saved. Father, I pray that you bless this invitation and this time of altar call. Lord, that you would work in each and every heart and each and every life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed. No one looking around.